everybody, and welcome, welcome to uh, the ballroom floor, the South Bank Centre, and uh, today's second talk for um, the uh, for 1418 now and the concert tonight, which is the Orchestra of Syrian Musicians with Damon Albarn and guests. I'm making terrible noises, so I'm really sorry about this. It'll get sorted out in a minute. Um, today's events are part of 1418 Now. We are the UK's arts program for the First World War centenary, creating and commissioning extraordinary arts experiences, connecting people with the First World War and its impact on the world today. Um, tonight's concert, marks the centenary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916. And for those of you that were at the talk this afternoon, you've heard quite how uh, extraordinary that moment was and the impact of the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the line drawn across the Middle East 100 years ago. It also marks um, a moment in the world where there are now 65 million displaced people uh, and refugees, many of them caused by war and civil war. Uh, so it's a particularly uh, proud moment for 1418 now to be welcoming our panel today and welcoming Africa Express, the Orchestra of Syrian Musicians, Damon Albarn and guests tonight in the Festival Hall. For those of you who have tickets, uh, please join us at 7.30. For those of you that don't, uh, it is sold out but uh, there might well be returns. So after this talk, do just dash to the box office. And I'm thrilled to say that the concert will also be live streamed on YouTube. So you could also go home, put your feet up and watch it on YouTube. But I suggest that you come to the Festival Hall. If their gig at uh, Glastonbury yesterday is anything to go by, we're in for a huge treat. Um, I'm going to hand over to Fergal Keane, our chair for today. Fergal probably needs no introduction at all. He became a household name as BBC correspondent in Africa. His moving and authoritative uh, reports from the Rwanda crisis and the, uh, the camps there uh, really made us all sit up and think. And since then, he's been BBC Asia correspondent and is now working with the BBC on the migrant crisis. So, Fergal, over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, our great Irish poet W.B. Yeats said that an Irishman needed a permanent store of misery to sustain him through any temporary periods of joy. When you look at the situation we find ourselves in today, in this country and globally, we're clutching for joy. But it is out there and it's here tonight. I'm really lucky to be joined on this stage by people who believe in progress and who believe that music has a transcendent power to lift us above the, the diet of misery, of negative images uh, that come from many countries in the world. And it's particularly true of the refugee crisis. I'm joined on stage uh, here to my right by Ian Birrell, co-founder of Africa Express, a former colleague of mine uh, and one of the straightest talkers when it comes to issues of refugees and international aid. Next to him is Tarek Zaidia, who still lives in Damascus and he's a violinist and you'll be seeing him perform later tonight. Beside me, Mirna Cassis, also Syrian. She sings with the choir and lives now in Italy. And then Eslam Jawad, who came to music via a very interesting career on the other side of the tracks, but we'll talk about that later on. And then finally, Regina Catrambone, who is the founder of Migrant Offshore Aid Station. That's called MOAS. I've seen them in action in the Mediterranean. They've saved over 12,000 lives so far. Again, practical, real action. So, Ian, I'm going to start by talking to you. You've just come from Glastonbury. You're still buzzing or exhausted or maybe both. What was that like? I think Glastonbury was amazing to be there yesterday of all days just after the Brexit vote with uh, some of the heat and fury that had been expressed during the campaign. And then to be there after this, can you hear this very joyful ride that we'd had working. We spent five days rehearsing together in Amsterdam before an amazing show there. Um, it's such a sort of pleasure and a privilege 
always with Africa Express because I have the joy of working with some of the world's greatest musicians. In the past, we've worked with everyone from Baba Mal through to Paul McCartney, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, young British and American and European rappers, uh, some of the great names of African music, such as Amadou Mariam, Timani Diabate, Spok Matambo. And um, this is very different to be working with an entire orchestra from one country with a Syrian orchestra, but it's a very special thing because their music is just utterly extraordinary and amazing and powerful and I think transformative. But on top of that, what's been so nice has been working with a great bunch of people and just having a lot of fun together. And um, Glastonbury, to be there on stage opening this extraordinary festival in the mud uh, and the rain kept off for most of it uh, was just it was amazing, really. It was a really, really fantastic experience. Um, the music has many messages, but if there is a core point that you want to get across from tonight, what is it? I think we're not a political organization. That's not what we're about. Uh, it's just simply we believe in music. We love music. And I think when you bring the world's great artists together for musical collaboration, you create mesmerization and you create magic. And I think we'll see that again tonight, where we have not just the Syrian orchestra, but we have big names from America like Julia Holter, we have Paul Weller and Damon Albarn, two very English um, artists, both very famous of course. We have artists from West Africa, from Senegal and from Mali, Paseko Kayati and Seko Keita, who are just dazzling musicians. And then we have people like Rashid Taha and Noura Mint Somali who come from a more North African Arabic tradition. And then when you see these guys all together, uh, it's an incredible thing. Tarek, for you, what is this like? I mean, going to Glastonbury, coming here, taking part in this tour. You come from Damascus. Which is... Yes. I think, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for everyone who, who gave us uh, this chance to be here, uh, to be in re reunion with our friends who has uh, uh, left our country a couple of years. We used to be together uh, performing a lot of concerts in Damascus, in Syria, and uh, many countries. But uh, once the uh, crisis started in Syria, so uh, each, each day we uh, say goodbye to many friends who left the country, to Europe, to US, to many places uh, around the world. So being together after five or six years in uh, one orchestra, it's something, something amazing. And uh, having rehearsals for four days, it's like being a family again not only by playing music, but also because there is a lot of things that we want to share, uh, stories, uh, many things like that. After that, we had the first concert or first show in Amsterdam. It was an amazing show. Uh, the, the audience were surprised by what we performed because there is a lot of uh, Syrian songs, Oriental songs, and a lot of classic songs, which are, were a mix between Orient songs and, and the classic songs, it's like a dialogue between Western and Eastern countries. So they were surprised, we were very happy to see this uh, reaction from the people in the, in the concert. And after that we went to Glastonbury, it's one of the famous places in, around the world. So once we were there, it, it was like a dream, oh my god, I am here now. So. It's maybe once per life, so we are so glad as Syrians to be there. And now we are here, and we are sure that we are going to perform a great concert as well. I'm sure you are. Ian, you want to get in again. One thing I should add is that when they got all, all got there, they got delayed and had to spend a night, the guys coming from Syria, uh, thanks to Turkish Airlines, and they had a, a, a night in the airport, so they all said they're absolutely exhausted. Although we did later find out that a bunch of them had snuck off into Amsterdam and been out till four o'clock in the morning. That's musicians for you. Mirna, Tarek spoke about somebody who has come from Syria, from Damascus, to take part. And meeting others, and like a family reunion, people like you who are now living in Italy. What was it like for you as somebody who's now in Europe? Yeah, actually, uh, when, um, uh, first of all, uh, I'm Mirna Cassis, uh, an opera singer. I'm living in Italy since three years and finishing my master's. And um, I started singing with this orchestra 10 years ago with uh, Maestro Isam Rafa. 
and um, I love oriental music and I used to sing it since I was like uh, six years and um, when, when they called me to, when they told me about this project um, it was, I was so happy because leaving this, this thing after five years, like we stopped five years ago and um, just the, the idea of leaving the same feelings we, we used to feel every time when we, when we go, uh, when we have concerts, when we sing all together. Uh, everyone, each one of us needs to, to feel those moments. We, we live in Europe now and we had to build a new, uh, new life uh, to, uh, to have new friends and uh, the, the idea to this reunion together it, it means a lot for me, see my friends, um, and my, my uh, friends of uh, singers and musicians again, sing together uh, these uh, traditional songs and the combination of, of the music with uh, Damon Albarn, it's an amazing thing, like uh, the combination of the oriental and the pop music on, and the rap and um, with, with the Arab relics and it's, it's such an amazing thing and... Um, As a musician, talk to me about you know, getting used to that idea of collaboration with such different styles. Yeah, uh, um, it's it's a, um, something when when you when you are cooking like something to get when are you when you are putting new ingredients together, you create new plate. It's something like that for me. Like when each one of us is putting his identity, his his what he learned from Europe. For example, each one of us is, we are building all together this music. It's not like we are following the, the score and that's it. We are all building together and uh, in, the, in, these, in those four days, we all worked all like for eight hours a day to build this music together. And the result is amazing. And you can hear it today. I hope you like it and you enjoyed it. Ian, you say it's, it's not political, but that description there about people of different cultures coming together, putting the ingredients together and creating something that is unique. Well, there is a reminder of the common humanity that we all have and the fact that all these people we see on our TV screens are, it's a, it's a simplistic and, and almost crass message, but we're all very similar people, but a lot of people are suffering. And it is beautiful, I think, the message that music can be transformative, that people can collaborate from any part of the world and actually, uh, I thought there was an amazing quote in the Guardian interview where one of the other violinists said that sometimes when you're in trouble and you bring people together and the, the, uh, the artist reflects all strands of different opinion, but that just makes you have to play harder and play more beautiful music. And I think that's what these guys are doing. A creative way out of difference, in other words. Yeah. Um, Eslam, can I ask you as somebody who's lived here longer and, and seen the change in this society from a musician's point of view. We can't escape the great elephant in the room that is Brexit and the, the kind of change in de debate and dialogue in this country. What have you felt in the last 24 hours as somebody who's deeply embedded in this universalist idea, but also watching Britain move away? I think it's very scary. Um, I mean, with me, it's not just about Britain. Obviously, I've lived half my life just for anyone that doesn't know, between Syria and Lebanon and the other half between the US and the UK. So just watching what's happening in America at the moment as well with the, the whole Donald Trump <laughs> nonsense. And, um, you know, Brexit and then of course what's happening in the Middle East and how the policies over here affect that. It just looks like the world is heading into a scarier place. But again, I think this is uh, maybe as um, our friend from the orchestra said, is a reason we all need to play more beautiful music together in every sense, you know, not just in literally in music, but all the people that, that have more like-minded spirit, uh, I think we need to, to make an effort to work harder to make sure that this type of thing doesn't happen. I mean, I, I get shocked, I sometimes, feel like it's it's like you know reading about what was going on in the 40s it's it's sort of like you're seeing that unfold in front of your eyes it's very scary um and troubling but i also do have hope and i always cling on to hope and i do believe in the better spirit of people i hope it doesn't have to get to the point where we have to see the mistake to learn from it i'm hoping we can see the past mistakes to learn from it before we get there but uh, very hopeful definitely i mean i'm also british so it's definitely something that affects me 
is it going to make you more political in terms of the music you create, or do you want to? Do you think music has to be? To be honest, like no. Um, my music's traditionally always been very political. I think I'm more inclined to the spiritual stuff now and my, the phase I'm in. I think we need more of a spiritual revolution. I think it needs to be a global movement. Think what does system. that mean? I mean, I, from, from my perspective at least, uh, I, I see the system as a global one. I don't see it as a local. Of course, you know, we're all different pieces to a bigger puzzle, but it's definitely for me something global. And uh, unless there's a global change, at least in a spiritual way of thinking, towards a, a higher ideal, towards a higher goal that could... Uh, break through what's going on in people's mind and the fear-mongering and all of this, uh, you know, unless something happens on that scale, I don't think there's really going to be change. But I do believe something like that is, uh, is possible in the moment, and the momentum for that is there. Regina, can I come to you? You're a supporter of this endeavor, but you're also deeply involved in practical work with refugees. I've seen what your people do, uh, and it's quite extraordinary. What persuaded you to become involved? Because uh, we couldn't stop, uh, we couldn't uh, just watch anymore. It was 2013 and uh, we decided uh, with my husband Christopher that we need to act. And so we purchased a boat, we created this uh, NGO, Migrant Offshore Aid Station. And uh, even if it uh, seems very easy to say, it wasn't easy to build this organization. But nowadays, uh, we have two ships, the Phoenix and the Responder. The usage uh, of drones uh, for search and rescue that expand uh, our capability of uh, seeing, ship, seeing uh, these uh, dinghies uh, at sea and uh, cooperate with the coordination center, giving them the visual and soon uh, trying to have uh, a reaction. Um, it's very um, emotional for me because uh, um, one of the things that the people do after the rescue, when they are safe, after they ate, uh, is uh, sing. They start to sing in the boat. They uh, are alive, so they are happy, and they pray and they sing. This is very emotional for me. So I believe that uh, music uh, is the key of uh, breaking the borders and create more empathy uh, to each other. So. We should use the music more. Okay, because one of the things that happens, uh, and I know this as a journalist reporting on successive refugee and migrant crises, is that people get, get to be seen as a mass and not recognized as individuals. If I'm watching people, Ian, as you've had the experience, washing up on a, a beach in Greece, you're not seeing the musicians, the poets, the playwrights. I think that's very true. I mean, one of the hard things as a journalist who, like you, has spent a huge amount of time on this story in the last couple of years is the fact that you're sort of telling the same story. It's people whose lives have been shattered for whatever reason and they've taken a desperate measure to build a better life. And yet there's a wall of resistance often to them doing that and they're exploited by people at every step of the way. And yet, of course, when you talk to them as a journalist, it's often really difficult because these are people, you talk to them and they're professors or they're dentists or they're nurses or they're students or their mothers or their daughters or their whatever, but they're the same as us, but you're trying to get across that story all the time. But on the, the visuals and in the newspapers and everything, it's just this tide of people. It's 100,000 people, it's Syrians, it's Eritreans, it's Ethiopians. And the struggle we have is to try and humanize that and tell the stories and yet keep telling them and keep reminding people of that simple fact. And to me, that's why projects like art are so important. We, we also have, I should add, incredible visuals by two Syrian artists behind us, um, which are really striking and again touch on some of these themes. But that's why it's so important just to keep reminding people of our shared humanity. And I think music is a very powerful tool to do that because it goes straight to your heart, but hopefully it affects your head. <clears throat> yes, please. Is this working? Yes, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add, it's an absolute honor to sit on this panel with you. And on behalf of all the Syrians and everyone who cares about humanity, what you're doing is absolutely inspirational for us. And we just want to say thank you. And it's great to have you here with us. Thank you very much. I really want to remark that uh, our motto is uh, nobody deserves to die at sea. So we really believe that people have the right to live, but also when they arrive to land, 
they need to be helped and integrated. And probably through art and music, this can be more, uh, more easy. So thank you for what you are doing. We should add, of course, that Regina and her husband acted when all the politicians were doing nothing. And they just saw these people as, as a great mass and it was allowing them to drown. So I do think she's an incredible figure, what they've done. And they've spurred Europe. They've shamed Europe into action to at least do something to try and save these lives. And when you think that woman there and her husband have helped save 12,000 lives, I've been on the boat and seen what they do, and it's extraordinary. And I, sh I should point out that today on your Twitter feed, hundreds more people have been rescued. And this is a crisis 15, we think has gone away. 300, mm -hmm. 300 yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, can I come back to you, Tarek, and ask, as a musician in Damascus now, what is ordinary life like for you? How do you make music in a climate of war? Actually, uh, your question, it's uh, for me. When I came here to, to, uh, to UK, I have one main message in my mind, and the whole Syrian musician who is also still in Damascus or even in Europe like Mirna, that when, uh, before 10 years back, whenever you Google anything about Syria, the first thing that you have on Google, it's... Uh, the best place in Syria, Palmyra, Busra, a lot of great things in Syria. And I, I, I am sure that a lot of people here in the, this hall has been in Syria and, and saw the um, uh, great places in Syria. But during these five years, I think, whenever you Google anything on, on uh, uh, net, so you found uh, war, uh, terrorist, terrorism, uh, refugees, a lot of uh, things that we, we don't use to have it. So we came here because we want to deliver a message that Syrians always speak the language of peace. So we want to show the people here in Europe and the whole world that we are here to show that we together, people who are still in Syria and who are not, uh, now out of Syria, that we are going to speak the same language. We want to, to I'm sure after the concert today, when, when you are coming back home and you go get something about the year, you will find this concert, the first choice. So this is the main message for, for us today. I, I'm sure about it. So in Syria, we are still performing concerts. We have our regular concerts. And we are trying to show that even if the war is existing now in Syria, but behind that, we are trying to rebuild our country. Our country needs us, especially those days. So our mission that by music, we are trying to do more than our best. Do people still come to concerts in spite of the difficulties? Yes, maybe the whole, it's not completely uh, full of audiences, but uh, it's uh, more than 80% or 90%. It reminds me of the violinist in Sarajevo during the conflict there who, who saw it as an essential civic duty and, and an essential part of being a human being to preserve something civilized like music. Um, for, for you, watching what's happening to your country um, from afar, can you imagine a day when you will go back and play with him in Damascus? Oh, um... After I left Syria like a few years ago, I've been twice. I, the, the last time was one year, one year, last year. But everything has changed for me. And, um, uh, and also, I don't know, it's very hard for me to, to sing in Syria now, in this situation, like, um, for, I don't know, I'm a little bit confused, but when I came back there, um, I had very strange feelings. I don't know. Um, and each one of us, when we, when we left, we stopped doing music because we, we were very sad. We, we couldn't know w what to do. What should we do? Should we sing? Should we start doing music? Or should we stop? Because the situation is horrible. A lot of people are dying and, and losing their homes. And then, um, and then, like a light in the in the in the in the end of uh, the way, like just 
turned on and told us, you have to keep going, you have to sing, because the music, with music, we can, we can cross all the borders that they are building and building, and we will keep doing music, we'll keep bringing our traditional music, especially to the, to the audience, because we are, this way, we are, we are fighting for our country. Nobody's asking you if you're Sunni, Shia, Christian, whatever, if you're a musician. Yeah, no, I just, um, not at all. I mean, obviously music unites if you let it. You know, there's obviously music out there that could divide, but I think one of the most important things, uh, this thing to me, was that you can't let them defeat you. If you stop, you're letting them defeat you. You need to keep going. You need to keep your humanity intact. It's one of the hardest things to deal with. I think, I don't believe I've been as stressed out as a, uh, you know, during this period in, in Syria's history as I've ever been in my life. It's, it's heart-wrenching. It's heart-wrenching to see what's happening to your country, to people you know, to people you hear about, to things you see on the news. To, it really is a heart-wrenching experience. And I've been back to Syria maybe 10 times since this has started. Um, my mother still lives there, so I go and visit her regularly. But I feel exactly the same way. Whenever I get there, it's different. There's this fabric of society, of this cohesion, um, has been affected by what's going on. The differences in opinions, the, the, you know, it's really horrible to deal with, which is why, again, um, just to sort of bring it around back to Brexit, I, I don't like even seeing that. You know, like it sort of reminds me of like that's the beginnings of, of these big sort of polarizations of society where it affects society. I mean, yeah, it is extraordinary, isn't it, to see how quickly the temperature can go up? Sure. I mean, uh, yesterday when we came out to go to Glastonbury, we had to get up very early. And to be honest, we we're still a bit late to get there. But um, one of the Syrian musicians came up to me and said, I feel very sorry for your country which I thought was an interesting take on our situation. But, um, sorry, I've completely forgotten what your question was. Now. It, don't worry, so have I. <laughs> I mean, I would just pick up on that. As someone who's, um, as someone who's covered so many um, civil wars that have arisen out of sectarian or nationalist hatred, the one message I have is it happens so quickly. It's like the, uh, the frog boiling sure. in water. Before no, we, people know they're caught up in this. Any of us who have covered these horrible situations know that quite often they begin in hope and end in hell. And, you know, that's what's happened and it happens time and again with humanity. Most, most times than not, I mean, it's unimaginable. Like, I mean, when, when Damon was with us in Syria, maybe a year before this happened or so, for the guerrillas tour, you know, everything was all good, as they say. And then, like, he was shocked, as, as everyone was. It just disintegrated much quicker than, than you could possibly imagine. It's terrible. You would have met Damon in Syria. Yes, tell us a bit about that. Uh, we have met, I think, uh, eight years back. We recorded a song, White Flag, in Damascus. So we had the chance to meet him uh, in, that, uh, in that day. It was uh, like also uh, something very special for the whole musician because Damon Alberts is so famous and to see him one day in front of you, it's not gonna happen uh, again. But thankfully again, we are here to, <laughs> to perform a concert and made a tour with him in Europe. So I think I'm uh, a very lucky man. How, how difficult, if I can use that word, was the process of collaboration? Or what, was it relatively straightforward? When you're trying to blend very different musical styles. Sure, it's, 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 it's completely different, but the good thing, or the great thing, that you are having a, a, a new experience by uh, uh, playing or knowing a new style of music. Uh, diamond music, it's... it's, uh, it's uh, 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 not so familiar in our country, so now we are uh, having uh, the chance to, be, to go deep in this, this kind of music. So maybe you will be like uh, uh, people who will get this message to come back to Syria and to show people in Syria how this music is, is, is it's played here in, in Europe. How this kind of music, we can have the chance to introduce this kind of music to, to Syria back. And Hopefully, once the, uh, uh, the situation is settled down in Syria, we hope that this project will be done in Syria and play this kind of music here, there. Okay. Um, Regina, you're doing an awful lot, so I hesitate to ask this question. 
but is there more that you're planning? Yes, uh, our goal is uh, not only help the people out at sea, but also build uh, more uh, safe routes, uh, removing the people from the hands of the smugglers. Uh, and the only way that I see this can be done, uh, opening to humanitarian corridors. So, of course, the people that uh, are eligible to come and they have the right to come should come in another way, more humane, more humane way and with their own rights, not like uh, is happening now. So we should move forward uh, in this direction. Ian, I'm very interested in the kind of musical approach and, if you want a small p, political approach that you've taken with Africa Express, because it strikes me as being so different to something like Live Aid. Very different. And maybe you'll tell us why it was important for you an event like tonight is removed from that kind of, uh, of aid agency pleading. Well, it's certainly different to Live Aid because at Live Aid there were no African musicians allowed to play at a concert designed to save their own uh, continent. So um, I think that was one of the things that motivated us to start talking with people like Baba Mal and Tanarawen and people like that to see what we could do to, to bring people together on an equal footing. And it's been a very evolutionary project over the years We've gone from playing in a pub in Brixton with 12 different bands, six African, six Western, to playing on a, um, a beach in Spain in front of 50,000 people, playing the first ever concert in Paris city center uh, in front of the town hall for 25,000 people, and uh, taking the train around Britain. And uh, it's great to be able to do these things and to, to let the process evolve. Um, and I remember at the Paris show, it's very striking when you looked out and the, um, this amazing feminist Malian singer called Uma Sangare was playing. And um, this African journalist said to me, this is fantastic because it's like Africa has taken over the heart of Paris for the first time. And he was an immigrant who lived in the outside, the suburbs there. So if there is a political message, it's about the power of collaboration and about breaking down boundaries and just about, we hope that if you open your ears to what's really happening in the world, what Africa is really like, Africa isn't just a place of conflict and chaos and disease and hunger and poverty and starvation, which is the image presented to us. It's a place that does have problems like all parts of the world, but of course it's also a place of vitality and change and families and fun. And this is, gets lost. And what we try to do with Africa Express is just to remind people of our common humanity there and to get people to engage a little bit more. And as I say, the message is always that if you open your ears, maybe you open your eyes and you open your heart a little bit more. And that's very much what we're trying to do here, which is it's a privilege for us to bring together these incredible musicians. And for me as a music fan, to sit there watching Paul Weller rehearse Wildwood with the Orchestra of Syrian Musicians is something I'd take a mortgage out to do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not exactly hard work Getting the visas is hard work, but not actually the, uh, the shows. But it is a pleasure. But also, it's just a great chance to, to let the musicians and let the music talk uh, in this incredibly powerful... And it's, it's the other beauty for me is that the musicians come together. They're often quite nervous to begin with, wondering, how is this going to work? You've got 100 musicians, 50 musicians, and how am I going to play with rappers or traditional West African Ngoni players? And within a few minutes, they're all working stuff out and playing around and exploring each other's ideas and instruments. And by the end, everyone is like a, uh, a very happy family of genius musicians. And for me, it's a privilege to be involved with it and to play and work with people like this. Um, I would just give you a little bit of advice in this post-Brexit climate I'd hold off on the mortgage. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Thank you so much to this wonderful panel. And uh, I mean, you can feel from what you've listened to tonight that the music is going to be, it'll speak far louder than these words, but they've been very eloquent, very passionate words. And I'm now going to call uh, on Jenny Waldman to come back and just uh, close up this discussion for us. Thank you so much for being such an attentive audience. Thank you. Um, all I have to say is please join us upstairs uh, in the festival hall at 7.30 for the concert. Please tell your friends to watch it on YouTube. And first of all, please uh, join me in thanking 
Ian, Tarek, Fergal, Myrna, Eslam, and Regina for a most moving, inspiring, and thought-provoking talk. Thank you.